Welcome everybody to this segment that we simply call Arizona Real Estate News with Pat. What's my rate, McMaster's price mortgage and the return of Ruby with Century 21 Arizona yeah. Foothills and Jackie from Century 21 Arizona Foothills. And uh, Ruby, glad that we were able to solve your, uh, you know, work with your agents at the talent agency and get everything resolved and how convenient that during this process, you were able to hang out in Colorado for a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> it was a nice time, and I'm glad we got it fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about M&Ms later, but um, hope <laughs> as I said earlier, you know, you don't have to wonder whether or not we talk about you. All you have to do is go back and look at a couple of YouTube videos. And, <laughs> wow, those guys are creeps. So we're going to talk about all the negative. All the numbers that are down, some of the numbers that are down, we're glad they're down. Some of the numbers that are down are puzzling. And then I'm going to I kind of want to raise the question about, um, I mean, it's it's impossible to know where we're going from here. That I can tell you. And I'll show you a couple of comments from one of the Fed chairmen and from Jamie Diamond. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to guess where we're going to end up, but it's interesting to look at the numbers and kind of dissect them a little bit. So I'm going to kind of read you a couple numbers here rather than put it up on the screen. But there's about you know, 10 or 12 different things here that I find really interesting. One is trustee sales to third parties are down 47%. What is that? Is that, is that pre-foreclosures that are selling to a, a third party, Jackie? Re repeat that. Trustee I, sales to third parties are down 47%. Would that be them buying it off the sheriff's sale? Would they be the third party? To third parties. Well, unless it's uh, somebody selling to a third party before it forecloses. Well, I, the only thing I could think of is if it's a third party, are they, to me, it would be wholesaling them. That's <laughs> what it sounds like. Yeah. REO sales are up. 333%. Now remember, REOs, those are foreclosures, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a heck of a headline. Expect a video to come out on that soon. But the numbers are we went from three to 13. <laughs> Ooh. And, and if you want to compare that to 2006, I'm sorry, 2008, like so many people do, I, I was with a gentleman that we used to buy them at the courthouse steps. And there were hundreds every day. So every day. Yep. Every day. Well, fix and flip sales are down 37%. And my phone's blowing up with investors wanting properties. Mine too. Find. New construction closings are up 7.4%. Makes sense. Here's another down sale. Down number. FISBO for sale by owner sales outside of the MLS are down by half, 53% for sale by owners have given up because the market they think isn't as brisk when, when you had all these bidding wars and everything uh, they, there were a lot of for sale by owners, but a lot of people just didn't get the memo yet. That inventory is really tight. You probably could have success if you were for sale by owner, but it tells me that they're going, well, this doesn't look good. I'm out down mm -hmm. 53%. Normal multiple listing service sales are only down 13%. This is year to date. Um, offer pad sales are down 76%. Wow. Open door sales are down 56%. Here's a big one. Another big headline. Redfin sales are down 100% <laughs> from four to zero. <laughs> <laughs> Short sales are up 12%, although I don't have a number for that. Wholesale transactions are down 42 percent and that's what you used to dabble in jackie so purchases by institutional investors are down 88 percent now this just should be really good news for buyers they've they've walked away this year they're down 88 percent overall sales are down 19 percent so those are our down numbers including now looking at the cromford market index has been sideways for several weeks here 166 163, 164, 164, 163.3. We're stuck in these summer doldrums. So those, it's actually kind of starting to turn down just a hair. I'm surprised it's not turning down more though. 
just for seasonality? Well, it's not turning down more because um, our listings, new listings are not coming on at much of a clip. Now, seven day moving average here is showing um, the new listings up a little bit after we finally have been able to erase the 4th of July dip. You see a little yellow line that went mm -hmm. down. So now under contracts have come up and they're down slightly. So that's kind of indicating summer, but uh, you know, unless we get a lot more listings, I think the CMI is going to hover a little bit. We're still at 77% here. We were running about 90% of contracts versus percent. But here's an interesting thing talking about the CPI and saying that, um, uh, let's see, can't remember exactly what inflation proved, proved more stubborn than anticipated. The Fed hiking, ultimately raising benchmark rates by five percentage points, the ser series of 10 increases. But the muted increase for headline CPA, CPI came though energy prices, even though energy prices increased 0.06% for the month. However, the energy index decreased by 16.7% a year ago. But of all the other numbers that I showed you that are down, shelter costs are up. And that's directly tied to supply and demand. Now, you're going to see a lot of uh, articles and YouTubers out there saying that uh, there's a lot of delinquencies and potential foreclosures coming. I looked up the FRED data it's on the uh, central banks, Federal Reserve. Here we are. This is our delinquency rate. It's sitting down here at 1.73. It's almost down at historic lows. So that's not raising a red flag. But again, it's down, down from up here at 11.08. Look at credit cards. Everybody's talking about credit cards. It's spiking up, but it's still historically low when it comes to delinquencies. So that's not raising a red flag for me. But finally... Got another one here for you. JP Morgan Diamond says, I can't get past the notion that we've never had it before. We've never had quantitative, quantitative easing like this before. We've never had quantitative tightening before. I think the effects in this market will be more serious than pe people think. So when we look at these numbers and we see that institutional investors have backed off and that sales are down, and the inventory is down. Um, what's it telling you about the rest of the year as far as our market? And Pat, we're going to touch on interest rates coming down the past couple of days. But so what do you think? I mean, it, I feel like we're just going to be stuck here for probably a really long time. Well, I feel like it's really going to depend on interest rates. So, you know, it, there's a lot of people that I think if we hit even six and a half, that are going to come back. So, I, you know, I think we're going to kind of muddle along, but I think everything depends on interest rates if they come back down. Now, I am noticing with builders, I just wanted to throw this in there with new builds, and I don't know about you, Ruby, but I'm noticing that the buy downs, you know, the 4.9s that we were getting all day long, and I think I talked about this a few weeks ago, um, you know, they were offering 4.9, the beginning of the year, 4.9, and then giving you, you know, saying they were giving you 30,000 off the price and giving you $20,000 in concessions on top of it. The concessions have shrunk dramatically and the buy downs, I, they're, they're running out of them. There's very few, it's only on the outskirts. I'm seeing it now. And, you know, with the quick move-ins and it's only on quick move-ins, but they're now running between 5.25, five and a half. And those were what was driving the new builds. And so I, is that going to affect the new builds going forward for the rest of the year? Is that going to slow that down? Because that's been higher than the resale market. Uh, well, I think it will. I think they're rent, you know, they're still doing well. They're up 7.3%, but then again, there's another number that's, that's down. So Pat, uh, what's going on here with the uh, interest rates? You had uh a good couple of days. Let me pull up your chart here. I say good when it comes to wanting to have rates to come down to get people into a home. So, some yeah, people I mean, we have. I mean, we have. I mean, um, right now, obviously, uh, today, the five and a half coupon 
throw that chart up there. Yeah, it's up. Oh, is it up? Yep. Okay, I don't see it on my Maybe I'm just delayed. But uh, yeah, we're up 47 basis points. The U.S. Treasury is down 3.7. So we had uh, the PPI numbers come out. They came in at 0 0.01 versus expectations of 0 0.2. So um, we're uh, definitely seeing some good days as here, right here. Um, right in here, we're seeing a – obviously, this is the actually interest rate chart. So this is uh, the 10-year Treasury. So rates have coming off. We saw this – tipping point about 4.09 on the 10-year treasury and we're back now down to 376 and um i'm gonna try to pull this out a little bit one year farther go away. my computer as you can see we're just stuck in this i think we're in this big channel um low of 3.42 or so actually 3.38 on the 10-year treasury and you got a highs of you know, we saw a tipping point back in October of 4.29. So, but we're stuck in this in this channel. You can see this these lines of resistance. Isn't it? It's really crazy how something will hit, fall back down, hits, falls back down. So we're just stuck in this channel. I mean, right here, right in here, we saw rates tipping here recently up until about a week and a half ago. You know, seven a quarter, seven and three eighths. I just pulled up rates. I'm not gonna bore people with the chart, but um, Right now, you can get six and seven eighths, you know, with a cost of maybe thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars. Whereas a couple, you know, a week and a half ago, seven a quarter, seven and three eighths was kind of, you know, par your tipping point. So we've fallen off probably a quarter to three eighths of a point. And to Jackie's point, people are waiting for six and a half. It doesn't, it won't, it doesn't take uh, several months to get somewhere. I mean, we can see rates move in a in a matter of one or two weeks. We saw a move from seven and a quarter down to six and seven eighths. For them to make a move from say six and seven eighths down to, you know, six and a quarter, six and three eighths, it really wouldn't. Sometimes does not take a lot of work, and um, so I, it's been interesting. I mean, that, it feels slow. It's sluggish. Like you said, I mean, the last several months I've been saying I think we're just going to muddle along here, and um, I have been to kind of go on my point. That I said about a month ago, about 70% of this one, people in this one survey say 70% of the people are waiting for five and a half percent. You know, um, I'm just, I'm really coming to the belief now, looking at the data and just hearing the psych, feeling the psychology is that the two one buy down is the best strategy. If you can get concessions, if rates were in the low sevens, things start slowing down. I think sellers start giving more concessions a little bit on the, on the resale side. And, um, if you can get rates, you know, six, a starting rate of 6.875, but on 2 1 buy down, you start at 4.875 for a whole year, you're in your sweet spot of where you want to be for interest rates. So I'm I'm the, of the belief that with higher rates, demand slows down. Now's the time to really find that house. Find the house, worry about the rate. You'll take that'll take care of itself down the road, I think. Well, I, it's interesting you bring up psychology because last week when rates popped up to 7.22, the psychology and the chatter out there was we're headed towards eight, eight and a half. It's a given. Here we go. We're going up there. Um, and, uh, and we're not. And uh, so it's, it's uh, it, I mean, it turned around quickly. Now, could we hit eight? Anything could happen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, Ruby, do you have people that are, that are worried that rates are going to continue to climb up or do they think we're, um, I mean, I know rates aren't everything when it comes to real estate sales affordability, but uh, what's the chatter that you're hearing, especially after having two weeks off? <laughs> yeah. And having a relaxed feeling, you know, my open mind. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us, Ruby. Well, that's kind of the thing. Um, I'm really still playing catch up. So reaching out to clients and stuff. So I, I haven't had any chatter as far as the, the rates go. Um, I've pretty much just been working with a couple new potential sellers this week and dealing with um, a contract that came in on a listing last week while I was gone. So I haven't really caught up with any of my buyers and, and where we're at with them and their interest rates. So sorry. So you, I think you selfishly spent time with your family is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yep. And the <laughs> son out on the boat, it was a good time. <laughs> I think well, it's I got this article to... here that I read on Market Watch, and this is one of the Fed chairman Williams, 
And he forecasted that headline personal consumption index will come down around 3% over four quarters of this year. And in 2.5 next year, PCE inflation was running at 3.8. But he said he predicted the unemployment rate would rise to around 4% at the end of this year and continue to 4.5% by the end of 24. The unemployment rate was 3.6 in June. But then he said that, uh, let's see, he says, um, no, the Fed's projected to raise like 25 basis points. But he said the banking sector has stabilized and there's somewhat less worry about potential, potential credit crunch from tightening the lending standards. But here's the interesting thing, Pat, is that we're seeing who'd have thought that the Federal Reserve tightening would get us into this situation where instead of slowing demand and lowering prices, it slowed down listings and gave us more housing inflation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's totally different than I would think. I mean, if you're the central bank, you're going, I didn't see this coming. I mean, Paul has mentioned about in his couple of speeches about the housing affordability. And I, you know, whatever they do, they can't. I mean, I'm sure he's mentioned that. So I don't know if they sit around and talk about that a little bit, but I just don't see where, you know, for housing affordability, you know, you'd have to have rates down and prices, you know, home prices fall substantially. I just don't see it happening. I, I see rates coming down much more so than, um, you know, the prices of, prices of homes. There's just not enough supply out there. Well, here's an interesting thing. Looking back in the rearview mirror to October 2007, more than 2 million subprime adjustable rate mortgages changed to a higher rate. So you were sitting down there at interest only or 1%. And in one year, 2 million of you faced not just a little higher payment, but a substantially higher payment. And it said millions of homeowners saw their monthly payment rise 25 to 35%. Fast forward to now, it said adjustable rate mortgages are just 5% of total mortgages now. Between 2004 and 2006, that number was 30 to 35 percent. Today, 89 percent of mortgage loans are fixed rate. That's 62 percent of U.S. mortgage holders sitting on an interest rate below 4 percent. That's why they're not listing. And it says yeah. there isn't going to be a wave of folks having to sell because they suddenly owe more money. So the crash that's coming is not coming for that very simple reason based on what we're seeing now here's the other think that you're... oh go ahead sorry go ahead Matt. no no go ahead go ahead sorry to interrupt go ahead well here's here's the big elephant in the room financially for the country and for the central bank because you know you and i you know we're all in this little real estate bubble right you know we went rates go down it's good for sales rates go up it's bad for sales um if rates go down a lot further, people will finally list their home. Central banks looking at more stuff than just, you know, Pat, Rick, Jackie, and Ruby. And so um, the federal government current expenditure on interest payments, take a look at this alarming change here. And that is when they raise the rates, the amount of money in interest that we owe on our national debt has exploded. So now you're sitting there as a central bank and you go, well, do I raise some more then? And if I raise more, is that going to put more pressure on regional banks? Because they own all that paper on lower interest rates on, on T-bills. Um, so do I keep rates elevated to try and continue to bring housing down, even though we see right now it's not working very well? But the longer I keep rates up, the more interest we end up paying on our national debt. And that's eventually going to put a heck of a credit squeeze on everything. I agree. So what would you do if you were the central bank? Hold. <laughs> hold. I, I think they should hold. He's creating more of an issue because what's going to happen is if they bring rates, first of all, they push us into a recession, they're going to lower rates. They lower rates, housing's going to explode. It, they, I think raising rates and July's meeting is a mistake. I think it's going to break something. I think they need to just stay here 
and let it play out and just they're starting to see the effects of it let it just continue it's like they're trying to push 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 to make it happen fast it's not going to happen fast they need to well, just that's hold what, that's what that's one of the things that barry told us when we interviewed him was that they look at things in the rearview mirror and uh so it's kind of like like you've always said, Pat, you know, nobody rings a bell. We're at the top. Nobody rings a bell. We're at the bottom. But three months later, you can go, oh, that was the bottom. Yeah. Oh, OK. That's when I should have bought or that's yeah. when I should have sold three months later. I agree, Jackie. I think keep it here because um, I think what? any move upwards is going to hurt with the national debt. It's going to hurt banking. And I'm just small bank, you know, small town Arizona guy saying. I, I don't really understand macroeconomics that much, but based on the numbers I'm seeing, I don't see any increase to keep pushing more when you're already seeing the results with inflation coming down. So, you know, are they going to go up 25 basis points? Barry thinks they won't. Yeah, I don't I'm think they will. They I, don't. Think, I think, uh, well, hoping is not a strategy, Jackie. I know. <laughs> That's all I got, though. I got nothing else. I'm just kidding. I heard that. No. Um, <laughs> we need strategies here. Solid concrete <laughs> strategies. I don't, I don't think, I, I, you know, I personally look, look at the PC numbers, the PPI, the, you know, you got the, um, the PC numbers coming out. There's the CPI, the PPI, the PCE, personal, con, you know, uh, consumer expenditure. You got to be running out of acronyms. I mean, everything looks that. like it's <laughs> I'm so yeah, confused. The FBI, the CIA, the IRS, a lot of, a lot of three. <laughs> I always say, if I ever have a, if I ever have an agency with three letters in it, I'm really in trouble. The FBI, CIA, or you know, SEC. You know, what the <laughs> hell are you talking about? <laughs> I'm following. I'm tracking I'm, that. Yeah, you never know. Um, but I, I just don't. I think the feds now are kind of like just at a point now where it's, you know, you see the numbers moderating. I think them raising the rates, obviously, like I said, they increase the debt, um, the credit cards, you know, it's going to hurt, you know, consumer debt. I mean, obviously, it's being shown that people are still spending quite a bit, lot more, you know, a lot more on credit cards. Um, but I just now I think it's just kind of a mute point. They're kind of we're past this euphoria stage of inflation. Now we're just kind of, OK, inflation is kind of here. It's kind of like, you know. Well, I'm going to, you know, do a pat as analogy, but it's like the mother-in-law. Okay. You get excited about her. She's here, but like, okay, just put her in the back room. She's there. She's going to be a pain in the butt for a while. And, um, you know, just let her, let her sit there. But I think, you know, I just think that, I mean, right now the inflation is somewhat being subdued. Um, like you said, Barry thinks that they're behind the, the eight ball, which they have, they're starting to show that now because they said, that, you know, they want to raise it, but he's been proven that they're always been wrong. So I, I just see the caps myself personally watching these interest rates. We're having these little spurts, these little two, three week spurts up and then two, three weeks down. You know, eventually we're going to get a trend here that they're going to hopefully be stabilized into this. Well, well I got a question mid- about that, Pat. So maybe so I I don't understand the spread that much, but I know our spread is out of line with what it should be. And did that have to do with banking? Because there's room for us to sit here and the rates come down. The oh, interest yeah. rates for, for mortgages, because the spread is greater than it normally is. So what could, and this is just my you thought. the spread between because, treasuries and MBS? Yes, yes. So my thought is they, they hold, the market feels more stable. The spread comes a little bit closer like it typically is. And we sit around six and a half percent. If we sat there, I think we would have a really decent real estate market. Again, yeah, yeah, I'm just stuck in the real estate market bubble, but not bubble people. We're not in a bubble. That's not what I mean. (laughs) But, but, you know, if we just kind of stayed at that six and a half, because we drop lower, prices are going to go up. We're going to have inflation issues again. And I think that's Powell's biggest concern. But just, just let us be, let it be. Have a coke well, and let it be. There's always there's always discrepancy between MBS and Treasuries. I'm not going to get. I mean, it's I some days I can explain it enough to be dangerous. But um, you got with the mortgage backed security, you got a lot more discrepancy and spreads. With uh, there's a lot more going on behind that because you got servicing rights that the lenders pay for. Uh, you know, with Treasuries, you, you, there's a different dynamic with Treasuries. MBS mortgage backed securities, you got if rates 
go too high. A lender does a, a loan at seven and a half, but then if rates fall to say six in a matter of two or three months, you might have that loan fall off your books. So you just did a loan at seven and a half, but now it's being refinanced. So there's a lot. There's that's why the spreads get when there's volatility, spreads get kind of whacked out of place because there's a lot more intricacies that go between a mortgage-backed security market than just a regular plain old treasury market. So that's why you see the spread, you know, a wide range of spreads, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Going back to Jamie Dimon for just a second, so, too. He, he said a couple things here I want to talk about that I thought were interesting. One of it is he said that um, consumers have money. They have $1 trillion more in their checking accounts. It's been coming down, and we think sometime around the end of the year that excess money will be spent. Even if we go into recession, consumers in great shape. Businesses are in pretty good shape. Diamond noted that many Americans have benefited from wage growth more than a decade of rising stock prices and home values. Of course, if you're looking at your 401k now, you probably wouldn't agree with that too much because um, they kind of got battered a little bit. So then he touched on something that I've touched on, and that is the work from home trend. So it's it's there's a little bit of pushback trying to bring people back to the office, especially with Amazon. They want people to come back in. So Jamie Dimon weighed in on this. Look at this. He says, it doesn't work for younger kids in apprenticeships. It doesn't really work for creativity and spontaneity. And that's where I was saying that in sales organizations and marketing, working from home, I don't think is that beneficial. It doesn't really work for management teams. There are real flaws. To the extent it works, I'm okay with it. If it doesn't work, I don't mind getting rid of it. We're not going to make the decision because we're pandering to employees. That is not the way to build a great company. So count me as a skeptic. He was sharing his view on working from home. So he's skeptical about working from home. And the reason I bring that up is that now you've got all these commercial real estate loans that are going to reset next year. And they're feeling because a lot of these commercial um, buildings are empty because everybody's working from home that, that they're going to be in, they're going to be in trouble. So is commercial real estate going down going to spill into residential real estate? That's another number that's coming down is commercial real estate. But it seems to me that residential real estate He's just so resilient right now that it's uh, it's hard to bring it down. Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, unless you convert a commercial bank into a, a condo unit, I mean, commercial, you know, commercial buildings, you can't live in for the most part, unless they knock them down, they build, you know, or they, they reconvert them to say condos. I mean, you're seeing that in New York City where a lot of buildings are being converted to condos, I guess. But, you know, the residential, like I, I think I heard Barry say, people have... People have a need a place to live. Take, take a look at uh, locally, Tempe Town Lake. Who are the big players in the commercial real estate business down there? Carvana. They're not State doing Farm. well. State, State Farm. Farm. They're not doing well. Open Door. Those are the biggest buildings down there on Tempe Town Lake. Open Door laid off 22% of their staff. Carvana laid off at least that many. In fact, they're subletting a large portion of their their building. So, and that probably repeats itself across the country. State Farm down there. My son used to work for State Farm. Um, they they sent them home to work for the longest time, and they didn't bring a lot of them back. So that building is not as full as it once was. So I think it's a real it's a real concern. Will it build? Will it bleed into residential real estate? I don't I, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, I mean, I'm just gonna give my two cents or three cents worth. You know, when you're talking about yeah, the corporate, uh, you know, huh? Make up for What's inflation, that? three cents. Yeah, com commercial, the commercial side of things, um, kind of thought a lot of it's it's an institutional game. It's not a it's not an individual resident or an individual game. It's institutional. You know, banks own the commercial loans. Um, institutional investors buy the paper. So if you think about it, I. The more I think about it, I don't think it's going to really hurt. It'll it'll certainly have some spillover effect, but I don't think it. The more I think about it, I don't think it's going to have as much effect as we think, because commercial and residential really are two different uh, parties for the most part. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think thinking about it commercially, who owns who owns? You know, you don't have individuals that own commercial buildings. Yeah, some do that are very wealthy, but you know, if they're wealthy enough, they have a commercial building, they could probably sustain that that hit. You know, if you're own a commercial building, I don't know too many built. You know individuals of buddies of mine that own commercial big commercial buildings like state farm or carvana 
that thing. So once again, it it's going to be the institutional investor. That if something goes wrong, they do a write-off. Boom. Yep. Now, we touched a little bit last week on short-term rentals and uh, talking about Airbnbs. And I've seen um, our gentleman that not only was interviewed on CNBC, but got interviewed on Fox Business Channel. I was like, what? Because um, that tweet got millions and millions of retweets. But um, he did admit and said, well, there's there's a difference of opinion when it comes to revenue from the source that he had said and air DNA, his source says that revenue is down 40% air DNA said we're down 3.8 Airbnb said we're closer to three. So the revenue drop is not as dramatic as what we, what, you know, was stated uh, on the flip side though, regulation is, is ramping up all across the country. Some really radical regulations on it. On yeah. uh, short-term rentals that that could either um, make it harder for you to obtain one or harder for you to do business. And so will that flood the market because we need inventory? And my short answer is no, not even close because we have mm -hmm. 18,000 here. And even if all 18,000 show up, you know, we're sitting here at an inventory level of 10,000. That would give us a 28,000. Isn't that normal? So yep. I, I, don't, I don't see that argument panning out. So where's our new inventory going to come yep. from and when? What do you think? New builders, new builders got to keep building. We're underbuilt anyways. They underbuilt for 10 years. So, and I, and you know, if we get back down into the fives again, we'll see some sellers coming to the market, but. Well, we'll see what happens. I, uh, um, we look at the housing supply. I'm going to show you this. Really quick, just to illustrate your point, Jackie. Here we are. This is the 20 year average right here, the blue line. Here we are down below there. So that is exactly what's going on. One reason why home prices are climbing, there aren't many houses to choose from. Recent Redford article, and thank you, uh, one of our subscribers, Steve, for sending this to me. Article shows that it's driving activity back towards 2021 levels. No, please don't do that. Here's a quote from Redfin agent, Jeremy Lucas. The lack of supply is making it feel almost like 2021 all over again. But higher rates mean bidding wars are happening more in the 500,000 range than in the 700,000 range because people can afford less. I'm advising buyers to shop a little into their price range so they can make a strong mm -hmm. offer. So bidding wars are coming back in certain price ranges simply because they're just aren't any there. And there was an analogy made on car lots too uh, that, you know, if you got a strip in your town that's got 30 car lots and there's only 10 cars for sale uh, there's going to be bidding wars for cars and that's what's going on in housing so i think uh we've got a well, way to go for this to shake out well perfect yeah, we example we ruby's listing on fryer that uh we just got a contract on she listed that at 520. We got two offers on it. We had other people wanting to make offers on it. And the offer that was accepted was at 530. And yeah. that was that was Fourth of July week that it sold, which was surprising. It was a pretty small And that was week. less than five days. Less than yeah. five days on the market. Wow. You know, I'm just gonna give a general general theory on my end. I think people um just sitting back the last couple of weeks, just seeing the stuff accumulate the last couple of months. I think people, you know, just seeing the psych, feeling the psychology out there. I think people personally, I'm not trying to, you know, we don't, we don't try to say, you know, take one side or another, you got to buy, buy, buy or sell, sell, sell. But the more I, I just think the psychology is, is I, I think people really ought to focus in, um, finding a house that good bones, just like we've been talking about, that people are going to wait for rates to go down. Um, I'd rather buy now, and like you said, Ruby and J Jackie, you're seeing obviously some bidding wars kind of come up a little bit or come out of the woodwork a little bit. I'd rather buy now where the competition is a lot less. And because once you get rates, you get rates in the mid fives, you're going to have those bidding wars. Do you want to be paying? you know, buying a house at 6.875 or, you know, I said rates will probably float down. They can float down in the mid sixes here pretty quick. I'd rather buy a house now and let rates fall to five, five and a half versus getting into a bidding war where I'm paying 20, 30, 40, you know, 
thirty, forty thousand dollars more. You wait a year and a half. I mean, the interest rate difference is maybe three, four hundred dollars. Um, you know, over a year, let's say that's about forty, five hundred dollars. You know, five, five, four to five, six thousand dollars difference in your payment. You know, a year and a half, you get rates that are lower that can you can benefit from that. I just think it's going to be a better scenario right now to really gird your loin and try to find the house that you want. If that makes I sense. think everything says that that uh, um, pay down your debt. So if you're not in a position where you can buy right now, pay down your debt. Get as debt free as you can yep. because interest rates on credit cards are through the roof. You can also see on that delinquency chart that there are people getting into trouble with their credit cards. So attack that first and foremost and save and save mm -hmm. your money. And if the opportunity presents itself, you're ready to go. And that's where people make the best decisions. It's when they're trying to scrape together everything mm -hmm. that they have to get into a home without being prepared that it comes back to bite them later. So, you know, get your get your credit card debt down as low as you can and keep your credit card accounts open because that's good for your credit score because you have a utilization rate that they look at. Uh, but that's what you should attack first. And then the next thing, uh, obviously, is your car payment. There's excessive dollar amounts on car payments, the price of cars have gone through the roof and people have, you know, extended the terms on the car loan instead of a standard four year loan. Now you're out seven and eight years, uh, but the payment's still through the roof. So, you know, if you really have plans to purchase a house, you know, get yourself a nice used car and, and buck, you know, suck it up for a while. Cause I, mean, I totally I agree. I bought my first house. Um, I didn't have a car payment and I didn't have any credit card payments. And my wife and I were were really pinching our pennies to try and get into the house, but we didn't have any debt and we were able to do it. And the payment was a stretch for us. We weren't making a lot of money. She was a school teacher. I drove a bread truck. So combined, we, you know, it was still a stretch to make that payment. Now we couldn't have done it if we even had one car payment. So those dynamics haven't changed much. Yes, affordability is a lot tougher right now. But the affordability index for all people that have loans right now is about 35 um, percent. So they're overall people that are already in houses are finding that they have a lower payment to income ratio at any time in real estate over a long period. So it's now if you're trying to get in with the prices that they're at where that blows that out of the water. That was great. Yeah, advice I, I for it. the big that's good, great advice. I mean, I think the biggest thing I see on my end, what blows people out of the water is just like, that's a great advice as far as buckling down instead of buying this 50, 60, $70,000 truck or the car. I see these young kids a couple, about a year and a half ago, I had I pre-qualified. I don't know how I got them qualified. The, the girlfriend or the fiance had a car payment of $850 and the guy had this truck that was like eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars. They had two thousand wow. dollars basically, almost in, in car payments. And I got them into a house. Don't know how, but um, you know, if you really want a house, they say you can live in a car or you can live in a house. Which one do you want? Because I'm seeing these the car payments are the ones, the things that are really blowing people out of the water in terms of qualifying. Because they're like, I look at the credit report and I'm like, I'm seeing a car payment of eight hundred fifty, nine hundred dollars. You know, I, I realize. You know, you want to have a nice car, but, you know, do you want a nice car or do you want a nice house? I think that's where people have to realize the next couple months what they want to do with their priorities. You know, it, it sounds kind of preachy, but, you know, sometimes you can't have everything. You can't always get what you want, like the uh, Rolling Stone or, or the, uh, is it the well, Rolling Stone yeah, says? You yeah. can't always get what yeah. you want. Can't always get, okay, let's sing it. Get a little harmony going here. Um, <laughs> I, that's my brother's example, his first house. My dad was a real estate agent here in town. And, uh, and he told dad, he goes, dad, and he just got divorced. He goes, dad, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go get a boat. And dad goes, please don't. He goes, you can always get a boat. He goes, look, I can get you into a house. Let me show you. Don't spend three grand on a boat. If you got it, let me show you how that three grand can get you into a house. And, uh, and dad got him into his first house and he made money on it and got into his second house, lived there for years. Now he's in his third house. It's a fabulous place up here. And guess what? It's paid off. It's That's He awesome. owes nothing on that home. Um, I hate him. Um, and I so, bet he has a boat now. 
He has a boat. He's got a hell of a boat. We went crabbing and shrimping. He's got a fifth wheel. He's got all the toys. Uh, he has a very impressive riding lawnmower. So <laughs> all of those things were acquired later. And so just reverse engineer yeah. your life for a little bit. Get get your your house over your head. And then, oh, I can afford a boat. He's on his fifth boat. So, you know, it, it works out that way. Not to mention all the kids they raised. So get that roof over your head first. Buy your toys later. So that's from Dad Rick yep. here. <laughs> Good advice. Good advice. Well, you're just well, God, full of great advice to, today. Everybody have a great weekend. I'm going to be camping at the Pacific Ocean starting on Wednesday Good. next week. So I'll hopefully I can send you some stuff from there. Uh, Pat, we're going to go live tomorrow morning at 930. And then I'm going to hit the road and have some fun. But everybody take on the day. Have a great weekend. I'm sorry it's so hot down there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. See you guys later. Bye. Bye-bye.